uh, recording? Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute everyone but Jeff here right now. So uh, and Mr. Preston. So I'm mute all. Okay, unmute. All right. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the uh, ninth CTGA Zoom meeting uh, today for Tuesday, the 16th of June, 2020. I uh, see the sun is trying to come out, so that's good. It's, we've been living in the uh, uh, January, uh, January, June, like weather uh, longer than usual. J June does get some cloudy, rainy days, but boy, this is not good. Uh, later, uh, when we're done talking with our guest, I was just uh, trying to figure out uh, for July and August, uh, on Tuesdays, what might be a better time, assuming we're going to have good weather and some of you might feel like going out of the house more, I gather most of us won't be working. Uh, so I was just thinking if we altered the, the Zoom time, uh, I was thinking that maybe the week of July the, well, July the 1st this year is a Wednesday, so we could still have a June 30th uh, meeting and, uh, you know, pick it up again on Ju July the 7th, maybe at 10 a.m. I don't know, just, just thinking out loud. Anyway, that's for later. Uh, let's say hello to uh, Colin Preston. And uh, Colin, uh, say hello and tell us, uh, first of all, a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Well, good day, all. Uh, yes, I, uh, I'm i Colin. And uh, Jeff kindly got it. I wangled through a former workmate of mine and a co-resident of Jeff's. Uh, Bill Morris, a cameraman from CBC. So we made the connection that way. Uh, now my history goes back decades, and I'm a, an emigre from the excited states of America. I was born in the Midwest. Uh, in what was formerly known as the smokestack economy, a steel mill town, now the Rust Belt. And my family uh, made that suburban move out to suburban California back in the 50s. So that, for me, is in all of its amorality, it's how I grew up and uh, went to uni and, and the like. And it just, it was a mere fluke that got me up to Simon Fraser in the early 70s to go through the PDP, the teacher training program. And so I had every intention of taking all the sweetness and light that I had learned at Simon Fraser. You remember that time in the early 70s where <clears throat> British Columbia was the first uh, jurisdiction in North America that outlawed corporal punishment in schools. It, it, it's, it, it's a remarkable thing. That's Eileen Daly in the uh, Eileen Daly Pool and Recreation Center you know of now in Burnaby. She was the MLA there and the Minister of Education. So I thought I'd bring that back to the states, bring up the, you know, you know, rising tide that floats all boats and it just essentially I got run out of town. So that was great. I, I don't know why and it's Wisdom Canada took me back in. I immigrated in 77. And so more than half of my life has been here as a, as a citizen, and, and that's all been good. Teaching lasted for a few years, but I just thought I'm delivering curriculum for mothers, uh, you know, set by the state or whomever to individuals. And I, my wife worked in a library, and I said, well, this is kind of cool. You come in and people have their own questions, their own curiosity, their own curriculum. And so one thing led to another, and from school, I went in the early 80s, went to library school in, uh, at UBC, punched my ticket there, and uh, from, again, being a total wipeout as a public librarian, uh, because I just couldn't stand the hierarchy, that's one of the troubles of being a lapsed Catholic. You really fight against the, uh, you know, the dominant paradigm. Uh, I had a classmate who was promoted to Toronto, and... Uh, and she said, you might like my job to work at a television station. So that was back in the late 80s. I took over cataloging daily news at CBC Vancouver. They said, oh, by the way, you're responsible for down in the third sub-basement of uh, the, uh, the film vault. And I knew nothing about film at the time uh, other than to not be afraid of, you know, the AV club kind of thing to reel it up and you know, and then of course I've always enjoyed film. So self-taught, I guess, autodidact to be a film archivist. And uh, of course, we, I was lucky enough in the 90s to have a, CBC did a large project. So I managed to coordinate a lot of people. And we, cat, we went, and I won't say that they're completely cataloged or completely preserved, but at least we identified everything that's in that vault. And 
that was just the greatest joy to me to see this treasure of, uh, you know, this set, uh, again, well, CBC is or should be a public broadcaster, this public trust that had been preserved. Because in many places, there never was policy. So when many stations went from film to, tel to tape, they said, we don't need this film anymore. And they just went to the, to the landfill. <laughs> so CBC Vancouver, CBUT, they're opposite the QE Theater next to Library Square. Other than Toronto and Montreal, the network headquarters of CBC Radio Canada has got the largest self self standing preserved archive of sound and moving image in in, in the country. So for you know for me I, that's that was a joy to work with. That was a nothing but a happy accident. So I've been retired for six years now. I end up back there a fair bit to get consulting and doing other things, and uh, you know, people still manage to uh, winkle out my name somewhere and, you know, they have a, a search or a curiosity. So I think I'm still doing the same things at a much lesser pace of, uh, of you know, answering questions, refining what's there, what their question is, and, and digging and in many cases finding something for the filmmaker or the family historian or the local historian or the novelist or the video artist, et cetera, et cetera. It's, wow, it's a good job. It was a good job. So when you t when you uh, went down and worked into the archives, uh, you uh, you had someone who was a boss over you for a while, and then eventually you took over. No, no, well, that was that was one of the my predecessors. She had taken. She had been promoted to Toronto. She left and was gone for something like six months before they decided to fill it. She flew back for two days for an orientation. And essentially everything down in the vault was, again, as I used to say, I was not the core business of CBC. I was maybe the tertiary or the quaternary business of keeping everything. So no one really knew what I did as long as I produced results that made life great. Um, for those of you who've worked in hierarchies before, you, you know, sometimes it's good, to, you know, when they, when no one knows what you do, it's tactically wonderful. It's tactically liberating because they're not aware of what you're doing. Sometimes when it comes to the crunch, it's strategically hell because you're the first one to be cut or, or cut back. So it, it, it has, it's a mixed blessing, but basically in my nearly 30 years there, I never had anybody who knew what the hell I was doing, knew nor cared. They just liked the results. And so for me, that was very empowering and liberating. A government job and no one knows what you're doing, it sounds well, like. Well, that's not so rare, is it? <laughs> okay, so just to give uh, uh, some of our members a uh, little background, the um, CBC Vancouver television studios used to be in an old car showroom on Georgia at Butte up until 1979 when the present day building on Hamilton and Georgia Street was opened. And originally, of course, it was these, um, it was three, about four or five stories above ground with those giant air tubes that were uh, heaters and air conditioners coming from the roof, blowing cool and warm air down to the TV and radio studios, which are underground. Now, when you look at the site today, you see on the plaza there, there's another two or three stories of building, which is where the radio and the news come out of now. But that was added only about maybe 10 years, no, about 12 years ago, I would say, Colin, that, that new plaza they added. That's right. Yeah. So Colin used to work way down in the basement of the, uh, of the CBC on Georgia Street there. Is the uh, vault still in that general area? They didn't move that? It's still there. The, uh, now, the, there was on that lowest basement, the third basement down, there were in fact, what I was able to establish then were, were, were three, three vaults, one that held the 16 millimeter film, which was what CBC television's medium uh, from their opening in December 53 until uh, and the last film wasn't, did, well, they didn't stop film until 1983. So essentially they had uh, 30 years of film. Then at the other end, there was videotape of various formats and then we managed to w figure out because there never was a radio archivist in place at CB CBU which started at the Hotel Vancouver as most of you would know and uh, it was all just little collections kept by producers and in the, their newsroom so we, ma we managed to create that 
in since the time I left in these last half dozen years, all the videotape has gone back to Toronto to be handled to a outsource to a service bureau to digitize and as has all the radio material whether they be uh, transcription discs uh, reel to reel quarter inch uh, audio tape uh, digital audio tape compact discs etc cetera, etc cetera. radio is it is what it was something i really got to get a passion for in the latter part of my years there because it has a longer, more distinguished history. When you think of all the things that happened at the uh, CBU studio at the Hotel Vancouver, but uh, there never was a system nor resources devoted to that. Television news particularly needed those images to rerun, you know, to say, well, before this politician said this. And so that was why essentially and initially film was kept. Yeah, so, so you said that the... Uh the film, the, the uh, so uh, CBUT Vancouver, Channel 2 at the time, uh, yep. uh, opened in 1953, film, they stopped using film in 1983. That's so correct. Was the, was the film and the videotape all moved back east or is... No, the, they were going to, most CBC, what we call regional stations, be they Regina, Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, uh, Halifax, you name it. Uh, they all, one way or another, managed to let slip or not retain uh, large film collections. Or they had already made previous arrangements. They'd ship them off in, in Saskatchewan to the uh, provincial archives there on Lake Wiscana and, or in, in the, uh, Winnipeg. They went to the provincial archives of Manitoba. So they were already gone. Uh, they're little bits and pieces, odd, you know, bits and bobs of film in those other locations went to Toronto. There's 30,000 cans of film in that film vault downstairs. In the CBC Vancouver. 700 Hamilton, CBU, there, CBU there, TES. Yes. Yeah. There's, and, 30, there's, and there was more than they could, no, no one could deal with that. So they, there it abides. If it was, again, a happy accident. Yeah, well, uh, a couple of things uh, for you folks. First of all, Colin behind him has the picture of the lions. Have you ever hiked up there, Colin? No, uh, my daughter has. She knows that well. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, that's one hike I'd, I'd still like to get to one day. Apparently, it's about a four or five hour hike from uh, Lions Bay. Uh, from anyway, Lions Bay. Yeah, big uh, slog as well. Just uh, a note about what Colin said a few moments ago about them, the, about. Um, was it CBC or other television outlets throwing out film? Uh, I know that BCTV, now global in uh, Vancouver, uh, they decided one day that, yeah, they didn't need all this old film, foolishly just throwing it out. Unbelievable. Um, something you'll find interesting, uh, uh, my fellow members, is that uh, Johnny Carson's first Tonight Show ended up also being thrown out. NBC a few years later decided, ah, we don't need all this crap, and they threw it all out. Carson was furious. He couldn't believe it. So as years went on and he became more of a star, and The Tonight Show became even more popular, in his contract negotiations, he got control of the show and the films or the videotape. And almost all of his last 20 or 25 years of hosting, and he hosted for 30 years, uh, that's all kept in uh, some underground vault in the Utah, the salt mines down there. I saw a picture of him once riding a golf cart. It's like one of those uh, movies you see in the military and they're under Cheyenne Mountain and it just goes on and on and on. So, um, yeah, it's important to preserve this stuff. Chuck Davis and I, when we first met in, uh, uh, would be Thanksgiving 1971, apparently that film, he was doing Serendipity for Global or BCTV then, Chan, C-H-A-N, and uh, apparently even that got thrown out, which is too bad because there was me as a teenager meeting Chuck for the first time. It's a great long story, blah, blah, blah. So how was it that the CBC Vancouver never got all of their old film? The, the CBC T Toronto just said, oh, we don't, oh man, that's way too much. You guys can just keep it. Well, he, the, the thing that, you know, he, this, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation really mirrors the country, the federal, provincial kind of relationships. And before 
uh, um, before we renamed it the, the, the Toronto, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, we renamed it as the Toronto Broadcasting Corporation, regions had a lot of agency, a lot of autonomy. They had what, you know, regional directors, then they would uh, uh, siphon down to a director of television and a director of radio. So they, you know, they jealously guarded their, you know, their resources, their, their purview, that what they thought was their mandate. And, uh, uh, you know, to, again, the, speaking the mandate of the CBC to inform, enlighten, and entertain the Canadian public. So again, I don't think it was so much a conscious act uh, to, to retain all this material. I think it was, again, out of sight, out of mind. Whether that you were at 1200 West Georgia, as you were mentioned, Jeff, Butte in West Georgia, the, the Packard dealership, <clears throat> Standard Motors, stuff was set aside for news primarily. And then, of course, once they moved down the, the vault to 700 Hamilton, this, believe me, it wasn't purpose built. It, we, they put the vault right next to the boiler room. So you can see how the priorities and the vision or lack thereof of management works. Uh, they did retrofit it with asbestos batting and the like. And in fact, that became a bonus later when they were looking to rent out space, repurpose space. It was the furthest most out, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And so it's sat there more as benign neglect than, than an act of, uh, uh, you know, cultural preservation. But that's just me being snarky about managers. Don't worry about that. Jeff, you're muted. Yes, I just got it. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Thanks, sorry. Maddie, I just got him. I, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, so the uh, email that went out last night to the members uh, saying uh, if they want to go to the Banalog site on YouTube and check out the, uh, uh, the various videos there, were you able, were, is most of that because you were able to submit that? I, I have conscientious friends who uh, you know, believe as I do that there, are, that, that there are things, and particularly CBC as opposed to let's say Chan uh, Global, BCTV, which is a private entity, or CTV. This is a, this is a, a, a heritage that's owned by all of us. You've supported it, you've, your tax is subsidized, and I really, I really have strong feelings about making things available uh, as, as far as possible. Now the whole, many, many people have commented, and they say, well, just, open up the archives, free it all. Well, there are other agreements with art actors, musicians, composers, producers, and writers that were done, particularly the dramas. And that's why a lot of things, that's why you can see Beachcombers on APTN, but CBC can't rebroadcast it or put it out there on the web. And I've, I'm waiting for some minister of, of heritage at the federal level to come in and cut the Gordian knot and say, here, let's put, X millions of dollars into a pension fund for you know, for the art for act, actra for the artists AF of M for musicians and you know put that in the pension fund and let's just cut all these agreements short and make it available to the public who paid for it and subsidized it in the first place. Wow! So even the CBC can't rerun the Beachcombers. That is correct. Oh, well, they could, but it would cost them, you know, so much that, you know, some, again, it's, it, it's, become a, it, it's become a question of metrics uh, and, and, and management. How are you going to find, you know, you have to find the estate of all of those actors and the writers, you know, who, or their survivors to pay residuals to. And that's why you need one large, this is my opinion and belief, not necessarily shared by anyone. That's why you need to really, you know, have a grand agreement that supersedes all that. Nobody ever thought of these things in the past when they negotiated series contracts and, and you know, and, and one of, you know, dramas, that there would be residuals, that there would be, that there would be the opportunity to syndicate, to, to put it elsewhere. Wow, because, uh, you know, that MeTV out of Bellingham, they run just about everything that's old. And uh, I often wondered why for the last 10 years or more, we haven't seen the old reruns of Beachcombers. Uh, would it not be cheaper for the CBC to try to find the heirs of the Beachcombers and do that than to produce another new show? A lot of people, uh, older people, like to, would like to watch the Beachcombers again. I would think it would be something they should go after. 
Well, here that's assuming that the that, you know management wants to think that you know that the, they want the hip young viewer you know who's looking at something at their device and they say, well, we we've got you you know us boomers us okay boomers all, already in our pocket, so they don't care. There's not a vision. I mean, uh, yeah. let's face it, and, and unfortunately, I would say. Well, let's see, the, the great lockout of the CBC was in 2005. So shortly before that, there was a major change in management. <clears throat> Fellow named uh, Richard Sturzberg was appointed as the uh, head of director of television. He consolidated things between radio and television and immediately began to hire at the medium and upper management echelons, people whose first quali qualification, as far as I was concerned, was to know nothing about public broadcasting. I don't necessarily think you have to you know, go up to the minor leagues of CBC in order to get a high level job there, but I think you have to have an appreciation of what public broadcasting is compared to private broadcasting. And that, for the last 15 years, since the lock, particularly since the lockout, of 2005 and, and the after effects of that has been the it's been the case that uh, you know it's there's real no appreciation of you know we they're still continuing to run ads when they should turn that over to the privates that would solve a lot of problems but you know there's there some interesting things going on there wow so uh, and as you said the uh, old cbc radio studios used to be at the hotel vancouver but a lot of the archival stuff from there was only kept because other people kept tapes. Oh, uh, there's a story about that. There is a there. There's a stash in the uh, in up in the Burnaby Heights, be, near the near the reservoir. At least that's my my last connection. When they decided to move from the Hotel Vancouver to 700 Hamilton Street, you know, something like five blocks east, six blocks or whatever. Uh, nobody wanted to undergo the you know the again the the price of transporting that stuff dumpsters of, of yeah. tape were being tossed there and there's a, a late technician there named Alf Spence my hat is off to him he helped he helped himself and this story is goes on it's, it's the same thing with Don Messer's Jubilee in Halifax it, there's, it goes on and on it, it, to the let's go with the uh, guess who out of, out of CBC Manitoba. Stuff was just tossed and other people retained they they scavenged it they salvaged it and so there is a basement of a of a deceased fellow uh, in Burnaby Heights with hundreds, perhaps thousands, I've seen it, I've been there several times, perhaps thousands of aud original audio tapes. Again, it was, this was, this was malign neglect, not benign neglect that caused that to be tossed out. Wow, wow. Um, Matthew, are you able to run us one of the old clips, uh, one of the short clips, uh, the, for example, Vancouver Three Cities? Is that something you'd be able to do, Matthew? I forgot to ask you this before we started today. Yeah, you guys just give me a couple minutes. I'll try and queue it up here. Vancouver yeah. Three Cities, that's the one you want? Well, yeah, that, that one's a short, uh, the brief history of Granville Street. And for fun, of course, the Bing Crosby 1958 Come and Visit, uh, come and visit British Columbia because it was the centennial of the mainland uh, uh, that year. Anyway, I'm just curious about any of those old things there. But uh, Colin, just back to you and these wonderful Vancouver and BC videos, that, um, uh, old, uh, you know, uh, the Vanalog on YouTube. Uh, again, uh, you had just a small hand in that or you had other people who helped get those uh, put on there? Uh, I I was, you could say I've been an encourager for that, but I'm pretty much of a technophobe that way. These are put, well put together and, and assembled in, in a site. And that, that's, you know, that's past me. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm too much into my boomer hook to know that, have that kind of skill set. So <laughs> I, I think what I'm probably good at, if I ever had a, an ability besides some visual memory, is recognizing energies, you know, like somebody has a skill set here and they want to do this. And I, you know, have been able over the years to unite people or, you know, get them, just introduce them to one to another. And so Vanalog exists. It also exists as a, uh, um, as a blog. Uh, so if you just Google Vanalog, uh, you'll see that it's also written in terms of, particularly now uh, the, res the, the writer resides in Mount Pleasant. So there's a real Mount Pleasant focus to that. So that's just someone who has a passion for local history, local memory. 
Huh. Very good. Uh, uh, and speaking of which, Jeff, you mentioned to me, you emailed me in the week, can I think of other sources of stuff? And I thought of all of you out there, you're, you're actually carrying the torch of Teddy Lyons, aren't you? Teddy yeah. Lyons was this you know, BC electric uh, conductor with, with a special scenic trolley, which is built like the, you know, like the low, like a theater seating and traveling all over. And that's what, you know, in your passions and your, you know, your sense of knowing the city, this is what you do now. Yeah. And which reminded me then, Jeff, there's all, you've probably all seen the stuff in the Trams Museum Society. Um, they do stuff, you know, and of course there's Alistair and the, and the bus tour, but they also have a site with some uh, local, with some local stuff. And as well, if you go to the city of Van, I remember having a part of this, <clears throat> The city of Vancouver, Richmond Archives has, has uh, the same kind of thing you see in that 1907 Harbeck streetcar film. POV, someone named Ted Clark sat on the front of, a, of the inner urban going down what's now the Arbutus Greenway all the way to the Steveston, you know, crossing the, the north arm of the Fraser, coming down and finishing at the, at the Steveston terminus. Uh, that's again, it's, it's on the, uh, if you go to the city of Richmond Archives, do a little search, you'll find that. Ted Clark is the, is the man in the late 40s who shot that. And he would hop off, stand at a station up if they were at 41st and, and uh, our, you know, in West Boulevard, the state, you know, the train would come in, he'd sit, shoot the next one coming into the station, hop on, it's wonderful stuff. Yeah, it is, uh, especially if you know the area well. And of course, when I see all the old Vancouver footage, even going up and down Oak Street or Granville Street, I recognize pretty quick because I've seen a lot of these old films over the years just pop up here and there and still pictures. And uh, so uh, that's what's the most fascinating part is I also grew up in the West End. I'm born and raised in Vancouver. And so we, wa we would walk downtown instead of riding the bus. We, we rarely rode the bus. We just walked. And uh, so, you know, seeing anything along Granville Street, Robson Street, George Street, Davy Street, uh, any of that stuff. So um, of the videos and things I looked at yesterday, there were uh, um, occasionally some of what the narrator is talking about isn't exactly what you're seeing on the screen, uh, but that's okay. Um, I, uh, you know, it, it's great seeing all this old footage. And I was just, uh, there is, by the way, for those CTGA members or calling yourself, if you don't know, on Facebook, there are a number of nostalgic groups uh, one of the better better ones is the, uh, I think it's Nostalgia Vancouver. I could look its name up more correctly. And they usually have a lot of good still photos that people find in their suitcase or trunks or house somewhere. And also sometimes they find footage that they submit. And, uh, you know, it's a short couple of minutes of this or that. Uh, many, many good old pictures of the city. It's, it's so interesting to see that old stuff and realize that's the same area where we go today, but wow, it's, it's like it's from another, literally another time or another planet. Unbelievable. Matthew, what have you been able to find? Anything? Uh, I've got the Bing Crosby one queued up first, so I can bring that up for everyone at the moment. Sure. So. If you haven't seen this one, folks, have, have a look at it. And Matthew, we don't know if, I'll, if anyone, if, 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 like, if I wanted to talk over it while it's on. I won't, because this one's a minute anyway. Let's give it a go. Oh, they catch some mighty big fish up in British Columbia. Salmon, steelhead, trout. We, uh, of course, all the big ones get away. I've caught some. We're, we're getting the stuff right across getting the border. Getting the sound about the uh, Certainly picture. is my idea of the perfect vacation spot. Now, this year, it's better than ever because. Yeah, that's, looks like there's a connection issue. So we're going to try one quick thing. Because. British Columbia is celebrating a year long this, birthday uh, party. The BC Centennial. Everybody's invited. Cross the border into British Columbia and, well, you're just in another country. You're in another world. From the Parliament buildings in Victoria on Vancouver Island to the wide, wide open spaces. 
Colin, do you happen to know how that came about? How I do. I can give you a little context on that. And that is exactly the kind of thing that Matthew was referring to. Things are coming out of people's you know, basements and, 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 and you're mentioning, Jeff, the photos and the like. I had a call in the latter part in probably about 2010 or so from a fellow named Mason Bush, whose father was Bert Bush. Bert's had a multi-decade career in the... the um, in the lower mainland, they ended up in North Vancouver with something called Bush Edit House, where people would come in, you know, who were doing independent films or spec films. He would edit for them. <clears throat> he also had a was a had a from his experience at Commonwealth Films, had a had a print duplicate a, a film print duplication facility. So this was something that was out of his. Mason was calling me because they were selling the house, the house, the building, the second floor uh, uh, where his office was on uh, Lower Lonsdale. I think it's about Fifth and Lonsdale. And we cleared out, you know, hundreds of films, lots of old uh, uh, Littlest Hobo and the like. And these were things that I guess Bert would make an extra copy for himself. So we grabbed those. I got them back to CBC, cataloged them, made it very clear that we didn't have the, CBC didn't have the rights to them, but we were holding them. And there's many you know, comparable collections. So this is just sort of a, a spare, a cast off from, uh, from Burt Bush, the late Burt Bush, via his son. Uh, there's lots of interesting things that he had from the 70s. Uh, uh, I couldn't quite tell. There's a fellow named Ross St. John, Ross Sinjin, <coughs> who produced stuff, kind of didactic films, one called Heartbeat about a middle-aged, uh, you know, uh, Willie Lomax kind of character crossing the Portman Bridge, going out to the suburbs, smoking too much, drinking too much, and then having a heart attack from stress. It was you know, really kind of a downer and that kind of thing. So, but there was, those things are just, weren't, there's no kind of, repository as there once was in British Columbia in the 70s and the 80s British Columbia provincial archives were one of the finest uh, institutions for inviting material to be you know donated and collected and then something happened and sadly to my to my way of thinking in the Harcourt regime cutting back money and they and, the, and things got done and never got restored in the, the latter liberal regime so they kind of had their moment and then they lost it. But they had a tremendous amount of stuff gathered that way. Well, you're aware that the Royal BC Museum in Victoria has an archives and I call That them. is the BC Provincial Archives. They yeah. too got married. Uh, There's a shotgun wedding. They formerly held each other. Yeah, so that is one and the same that we're referring to. Yeah, and they okay. were for formerly, I'm, I'm just saying, in terms of sound and moving image heritage, some of you may have seen those sound heritage uh, publications that they used to do. They used to do a tremendous amount of outreach and, and using repurposing archival material. Now they're more of a traditional archive where they sit wait, passively waiting for stuff to come, whether they be inquirers or the like. They're not proactive any longer. Well, yeah, okay. I bumped into uh, famed uh, Vancouver broadcaster Red Robinson last year, early in the year. He lives not far from me. Uh, we see each other every once in a blue moon. And um, I, uh, he was telling me that I think Simon Fraser University has a lot of his old stuff or something like that. And I, because I asked him, what's going to happen with all of your old things? You know, CKNW's Jack Cullen, before Jack Cullen died, he sold everything to CKNW and they promised to keep it and preserve it and so on. As far as I know, they have. So he said, uh, so Red said that his stuff was, uh, if not all of it, was being somewhat looked at by SFU. And I asked him if he was aware of the Royal BC Museum has an archive and he said no. So I contacted them and had them contact him because uh, they're interested in getting a, whole, uh, getting a you know, his tapes as well, and also preserving them. So hopefully that goes forward. It was a bit of a sideline side that I got to do in the, these last, this last decade or so, which was uh, working as an appraiser. Uh, because when people do donate to an institution, a not-for-profit or institution, they can often be uh, given a, a tax receipt for their, their value. And so I've had a lot of dealings with the uh, Simon Fraser Special Collections, uh, 
UBC has an archive and special collection uh, with the provincial archives. The last thing I remember there was <clears throat> they had ended up with all the film records and the like of Phil Borsos that some of you might remember from, so, you know, from the Gray Fox film and a, and a too early death. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, just back to the Bing Crosby thing for a moment. So uh, Bert Bush had a copy of it and you happened to see it. Bert Bush had a copy of it. That was all going to destined for the landfill. And his son Mason was was good enough to say, would you take it on? Well, I've, I think, again, that was part, it's not in any mandate, certainly by anything what the CBC would say, would, you know, you don't have anything to do with it. But I, I always held a responsibility as a film foster parent. And I never thought, well, we're going to, acquire this and use it for our own purposes but we'll look after it because we had enough sort of institutional resilience to do that mm. so there have been several collections like that 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 and little bits and bobs as well but the Bert Bush stuff was a lot of tourism material uh these sort of didactic or these uh, uh, uh uh, warning f kinds of films that that he had processed he would show up on the credit rolls of many as the editor as well but in this case this uh, Bing Crosby one the other one you might want to look at later Jeff because you're talking about walking from the West End is that one called Robsonstrasse which you will remember as old Robson Street with international news etc and the uh, and the German flavor to it uh, for, exactly for, for about two blocks of it anyways but you know, by the 1980s, mid 80s, especially as Expo came along, that started to become a more international uh, flavor to it. And, uh, you know, the, the German kind of end of things faded away, unfortunately. Uh, Matthew, did you want to try uh, anything again and uh, see if we can get the glitch out? Uh, I'm trying, but it's just a slow internet connection where I'm at. I don't know if, if I can if share I, both if as I, well. If I run that uh, three cities one by holding my cell phone up to my iPad's camera, will that be all right? I mean, totally up to you. I, yeah. Yeah, let me see if I can get that to come up then. Uh, by, uh, by the way, if some of you folks went to that YouTube.com uh, analog and you had trouble um, getting the, um, uh, you know, finding, because like sometimes when the page opens, there's so many listings, there might only be seven or eight listings, and it's not the one you want. Uh, you just have to fiddle with that page, look for the three little dots, make make the page move or just over. just click on what it, where it says videos, and that will give you the whole. Yeah, yeah that's it. it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let me see if I can uh, find the one you sent me the other day. That'll open it up on my iPhone here. And uh, yeah, should be here in a moment. Uh, ah, here it is. Okay, let me get that going. We'll see your steady hand, Jeff. Yeah. Okay, I found what I'm looking for. Okay, uh, we've got it. Oh yeah, videos, yeah. Okay. And I'm going to try to find the one that's uh, Vancouver Three Cities here. The, there was, uh, the Newsy Jack one was an interesting one. Just for a minute, at the corner of Georgia and Bramble by the Hudson's Bay, uh, the fellow that used to sell newspapers on the corner there. Uh, for folks who don't know, the Vancouver province used to publish in the morning, and the Vancouver Sun would publish it in the afternoon. So on your way home from work, you could get a Vancouver Sun from a number of people that were trying to sell them. Um, let's see here. Well, that's also available. There's a, uh, the, the writer of the blog, Vanalog, wrote about Newsy Jack, N Newsy Jack Kanchikoff, who was a great, uh, uh, you know, as, a, as an immigrant, uh, came, vended there at that prime location, did a lot of uh, uh, fundraising every Christmas, you know, every Christmas season, Yuletide. Uh, so there's other things that you can find out about Newsy Jack. And that little bit that you see there was all that remained was some, uh, that again was shot for another purpose. But when Newsy Jack died, that's the footage of the silent footage they aired for his obituary. And then they read from a new, the newsreader would read a script over the top of that. All right, well, I found, uh, what is the one that's Robson and Canby, 52 seconds from 64? That stock footage uh, of the, you'll see where, when the Connaught Bridge was in place, as opposed to the Canby Bridge, traffic would come one way, heading westbound on Robson. 
All right. Well, I'm going to oh, bring that. I'm going to well, try to. By all means, pull it up. It's stock footage. It was shot for something else uh, entirely. Okay. Let's see if I can get this to go full screen here. And uh, there's no sound to it. It's silent footage. Oh, okay. Wait a sec. I got to. Uh, yeah, you need to. Yeah. Get rid of okay. my virtual. Background. Jeff, I'm going to I'm going to pin your video so it won't. Uh, there you go. There you go. Let's see what happens. The only commit sin you can commit in video is to go to black, Jeff. And here you are. We're gone to black. There and there, <laughs> I can see it, it's great on the side. So there you can see the building. There you see along Beatty Street. And now is all that westbound traffic one way on Robson. So that's just down opposite the, I think it's a 7-Eleven now, opposite uh, Library Square there at uh, Hamilton. And there you are. There's no sound. So I found Robson Strauss at 1964, three minutes and 28 seconds. Oh boy, there's a good picture there. And let's see if we can get that to, uh, I, I don't think you'll hear any sound on this one either. Well, there's the uh, Vancouver Art Gallery today, then the courthouse. D where Duthy Books used to be. You see yeah. that building, and you can see the dance land sign at the, at the uh, southeast corner. I love those old garbage cans. Yeah. Now there was a there was a period of time when there's Robson Street now. Is that from roughly Burrard Street? So that in Burrard, you can see that Robson was two way there. Well, of course now you just saw that one way traffic going past the law courts, and of course now that's a, a pedestrian plaza. So once again, things right. change. The more. Major, 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 major. And I'll be damned if I know where this place is. Trying to figure uh, that out. That was probably uh, just uh, just there around Hornby Street, long before any of those buildings were around. It's funny because uh, when you look on Robson Street today, you still see some of those old buildings, but the street level entrance is all modernized. It's the upper floors that still have the older look to them. Although there's not many of them left. Oh, that's in German, right? The and then you'll see a, a, a Hungarian one coming up here, a little below. There you go. Canada, Mike. Yeah, so they got a little bit of everything at the, inter, you know, the international news. I just the sort of low streetscape oh, yeah. when you look oh, yeah. at the distance. <laughs> the thing that's nice about film is that uh, it was cumbersome and heavy to use and you didn't, it wasn't like having a little uh, mini video camera that you can just point and turn. They had to be conscientious set up. So often you can see a sequence of things just as they were shooting bit by bit, moving down the street with their tripod and setting up at the next store and the next store or the next landmark to the next landmark. It's very, film in those days was then very linear. Today, yeah, when you I, talk about a non-linear editing, you can mix and match. To me, the six most evil words in production are, we can fix it in post, <laughs> rather, than, rather than planning a sequence and figuring out what it is that you want to do. Wow. Uh, but some of that footage I looked at yesterday looked like they were holding, like the one about the bus driver, looked like they were just holding the camera. Yeah, now that the, the day in the bus driver, day in the life of a waitress, day in the life of an elevator operator, day in the life of a barber. I did meet the barber, by the way. That's not on anybody's website yet, but it was great to track him down. Um, that was done as part of the 7 o'clock show, which some of you may remember from that time. Local television had an hour to do current affairs features, interview people coming, celebrities coming in town, very much like the Vancouver show on CKVU. Yeah. And so that's how that, that worked. And that's what those little day in the lives were, Jeff. So wow. it, 
you know, just a little produ produced voiceover from the bus driver. And then just that almost all of that was POV, just driving down to Richmond and turning around and making the return trip. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't find that Vancouver Three Cities one because uh, not that it's critical or anything. I just thought some of the tour guides, some of the uh, 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 newer tour guides, uh, newer to our association in the last five, you know, couple of years, five years, they don't realize that South Vancouver, East Vancouver and downtown were all once kind of separate little areas there. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, are you going to be, uh, uh, is there other stuff that people can contribute to the analog? If somebody, if somebody uh, contacted me and said, I've got some old footage my dad shot or something like that, can they well, get this on the analog? Well, they, they could, but then in many cases they don't, often people don't know what to do with it. I'm happy to talk to people at any time, any place, you know, to see what they'd like to do about donating or, or uh, duplicating preserving their material. And I'd like to think that I've done a, a few things to help people, you know, identify material. People, we used to have home movie days and they may return past post COVID. And that was a little group that I belong to, Audiovisual British Columbia. <clears throat> they were, we would have a, a Saturday day. We've had that at the uh, Western Front in the past. Uh, we've had it at uh, <clears throat> the Center for Digital Media on Great Northern. And people come in with their stuff, we, and they, we look at it, we appraise it for the condition, and talk with people about it. And if they choose, we'll always have a banks of, of projectors for the appropriate gauge film. And you know, if they'd like, we can screen it there. And that's always been a, it's a, it's a labor intensive sort of thing to do, but it's wonderful. Do we know if anybody's going around uh, now with a camera and just recording, driving up and down the streets? Well, isn't everyone? <laughs> Google, Google Maps. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Colin regarding his? Uh, uh, so you were a CBC archivist for about twenty-five years, thirty years, twenty-seven years. Yeah. Wow. Does anybody have any, any questions? Well, you are familiar with this city of reflections, the, uh, the where they re where they reproduce the Harbeck thing. That was I. I was involved in that project, and it was great because. Those of you who are around before will remember before 2010 that they had closed off and were tunneling through uh, down Granville Street for the Canada line. So you know, that was 2000, leading up to 2007. So our intention, of course, was to shoot point of view POV, the same route as the Harbeck 100 years later. Well, that became a hell of a deal because of, of that construction closure. So we ended up shooting the stretch along uh, uh, Granville before they closed it. And that's, of yeah. course, when they were diverting, detouring the transit traffic down down Seymour and Howe, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, yeah. that's even a, a, a falsity or a fake, if you will, that you've done a couple of years apart from one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wow, and, fantastic. So, and so, I have spent a lot of time slagging CBC managers here. Uh, forgive me for that, CBC managers, wherever you are. They did supply a lot of, you know, truck and, and, and cameramen for those, that project. So, you know, at, for the right time and the right place, they, they do, 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 you know, it's kind of like what Winston Churchill said about America. You can trust them to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. So <laughs> that's, you know, that's kind of how it, it always was at, at CBC. You know, you just kept arguing and making points and they would say, finally, okay, maybe just to get rid of you. But it worked after a fashion. Say, I, I'm writing that down. I love that quote. Uh, you can trust them to do the right thing after they've done everything else. After they've tried everything else. Yes. You may, have, you, you may be witnessing that as we speak. Yeah. T t tell us a little bit about that digital center on Great Northern Way. Uh, what is their main? Is is that where people go to learn about film and stuff? For her? well, uh, the the in fact the 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 classmate of mine, Jeanette, who had left the job at vacated the job at CBC that I inherited in the late eighties, uh, then became the administrative administrator of the Center for Digital Media, and I, I think her best definition. So those of you would know it, it's just to the east of uh, the new Emily Carr campus. It's on that same prop, thinning property. 
uh, she essentially called it an MBA program for game pro, for gamers. So people who had that passion to do uh, uh, digital media, be it a, you know, gaming is one of the primary ones. This was then working in groups. Find, there's a very international component to that student body. Uh, they need to know all the business chops in order to to create startups to, to make things happen. So that's what goes on at the Center for Digital Media. But behind that, where there's a coffee bar now, uh, there was a large building, uh, which was finning used as, as a maintenance facility. And that was where you know, they have green screens and all that set up. So it was a wonderful for the whole movie day uh, bookings and, and use. People would come in, we triage them, register, they would go over, I'd typically be a, a, a you know, a triage, a, a, an appraiser, you know, to look at the condition of the film, see if it, what kind of storage it had been under, test it with uh, acid st detection strips to see if it had begun to have vinegar syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'd, I'd like to find uh, uh, somebody who'd like to work on a project of uh, any, any video or film they have of Robson Street over the years, you know, going up and down the street once in 1907 and then again in 1997 and so on and so on. But uh, uh, it, that would be downtown in the West End or where people really notice the growth, the neighborhoods. Oh, by the way, yeah, the, um, the people who uh, didn't get a chance yet to go to youtube.com vanalog to build a better city from 1964, it's 14 minutes long and it's the, um, it's a look at what, they decided they would do to the old dilapidated homes in Strathcona and uh, Falls Creek. And of course, some of the old homes are still there and have been beautifully renovated, but the plan that they had, that's a real eye-opening uh, uh, video, the To Build a Better City from 1964. Uh, uh, it talks about the, you know, they didn't call it the projects, I don't think, but it, it, that was the Slums. term. Well, the Campbell Street, for example, that was- And they also the called it Blight. Yeah. Yeah, well, they didn't when they were approving it in 64, though. They thought it was the way to go, the way to no, get No, 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 they, they were talking, you know, they had willfully, you know, chosen to withdraw city services from that area and improvements and street repairs. So they said that they existed a state of blight. So this will be the urban renewal that will take place. Here's the vision of these towers. And you look, you're talking about that little animated sequence when you get the parks and the Parkland yeah. and the high rises going up. Oh yeah. Well, some of those high rises are still there. The one on Gore at uh, Georgia and uh, Union Street. I, uh, my wife and I just happened to walk that neighborhood for something to do a couple of days ago. And uh, you know the the old the old buildings, the the the, the modern homes that have been renovated, the uh, the ones that are still in poor shape. It's a wonderful area. You only need to walk about four blocks along Union to, uh, down to uh, uh, Campbell Avenue and then walk over one block to Georgia and along Georgia back towards Gore or to uh, Main Street. And it's just eye opening. Uh, Wall Street is another great street if, you, if you're looking for a place to go for a walk between New Brighton Park and uh, Powell along Wall from New Brighton to Powell Street. It's a wonderful neighborhood. Parks in there, uh, re renovated homes, new homes, old homes great, great area of the city to explore. Well, those are the luckiest people in, in the city having, you know, on the east side to have that kind of uh, view across the inlet to the North Shore into the mountains, it's just fantastic. Those people who are particularly on the, uh, you know, on the north side of Wall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They've got some stunning views, but they have to put up with a lot of train noise. Well, yeah. there you are. Yeah. There was a time before 9-11 when there was one of those little parklets, I think at the foot of uh, Nanaimo, when there was a, 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 la a, la you know, a ladder device yeah. doing it that spanned the tracks and then took you down to Commissioner Street. So for those of you uh, who wanted to go out for a seafood dinner or take a stroll before all that was closed off, before the, can you know, the cannery was still in place, uh, it was great. Just the, yeah, fantastic. Well, all right, if nobody else has any questions, any questions, anybody? Well, I hope so. I'm, I'm curious, uh, move, holding movie rights, is the same thing as music rights, that you can keep it only for 50 years after first publishing or getting residual income for the, for the artists? So yes, well, I, I, 
you know, let's a lot of that, uh, particularly in the early days, Renzo, that uh, um, there was original compositions that were done, you know, for, you know, for that, for, you'll see uh, there's a little excerpt in that uh, Manalog's YouTube from uh, Summer Afternoon, which was done by a fellow named John Avison, who was the conductor of the CBC Symphony Orchestra, also a reserve colonel or major in the, uh, um, one of the reserve brigades here in, in the city. So a very important character in, in Vancouver's history, John Avison. So yeah, I, I mean, because things weren't thought of in those days. You have the residual, you know, the performers, you know, uh, rights. You have the, uh, the biggest time I remember, I licensed some footage that we found from a Beachcomber episode <clears throat> years ago. A filmmaker here in town was uh, doing a biography of Mandrake the Magician, who, uh, you know, they made a cartoon about him, but he was originally from New Westminster, a, you know, BC character. And I found a sequence in Beachcombers where he was performing a magic scene in a, in, a, in a cabaret. So it was one of the few surviving motion picture images in color of Mandrake doing something. And his widow you know, had given her authorization. There was no audio, so we didn't have to worry about that. It was shots behind the heads of the people seated in the cabaret, so we didn't have to pay royalties there. We had everything going. And then there was a, a, a suit from the, the fellow named Mark Strange, who was the creator of the concept of the beachcombers. And the allegation was because of the, if there hadn't been the beachcombers as a show, there would be no, there would be no acting. So therefore he deserved a residual. So I can understand the caution that any manager, CBC or otherwise would have about re-airing things. But that's where I, I was saying what you'd really need is a grand agreement, you know, sort of a, a, a grand sort of understanding, you know, wherein you acknowledge all those residual rights, pay something to the pension funds for those, all those kinds of uh, creators, and then go from there. Because it's just having this stuff qu quarantined, I guess that'd be the term we would use now, from acts, you know, from the public is, is just unconscionable to me. I've, it, it's just, it was a joy for me to be able to screen this stuff, you know, day after day and learn about Canada and learn about Vancouver, British Columbia. And that's one of the things to, re to remember as well. It wasn't just Vancouver's history. They had camera crews all over the province, you know, doing the kinds of things. You know, we had Diary of a Whale Hunter, for God's sakes, and, and you know, all kinds of things to do with forestry when we had first growth. So when we were hewers of wood and drawers of water. Uh, it's it's tremendous. And the coal mines of Michelle up in the Kootenays, which are, you know, along a ghost town now. Some of the old uh, Macmillan Bloedel forestry films and other other people of the era who were big and uh, uh, big uh, corporations, did they must have kept all their old films. Did they ever turn everything, anything over to our, an archive type people? They... They might, or if they could get a, a donation somewhere, that that's the case. Um, um, there, it's 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 really scattered. And you know, one of the things I enjoy watching more than anything else are old commercials. And I think you'll see in the Vanalog uh, YouTube site there are some old British Columbia-made commercials. Those were kept not by the company being you know, that is advertising the product, but by the agencies that created those ads. So when those those things showed up in again in Bert Bush's collection of you know he filched an extra copy, but I mean it's just really interesting the, the the track and the trail of where stuff and you know who gets it when it's had its airing its run whether it be a you know a commercial season or a television broadcast season nobody thought again in the digital world that we have now where you can infinitely re-air and rebroadcast and mix and match stuff. So what, when Beachcombers was running, was it also being shown in countries like Australia, New Zealand, or the United States when it was, when it was still on the air? Oh, for Christ's sakes, Beachcombers was a big, big money maker. It was dubbed into, we have Spanish language tracks, uh, Italian. I mean, it was, uh, there, were, there were all, yeah, Beachcombers aired in a lot of places. I mean, and in fact, it was probably the last 
again, when we were, I was talking about regions versus network, you know, where we use all kinds of regional crews. Uh, what CBC did after that, things either got amalgamated with Toronto production, you know, CBC Toronto production staff, or more is what you see now when you see things, dramas that air on CBC. They're commissioned from an independent production house. And I'm not saying that everything has to be, you know, we didn't call it the post office of broadcasting for nothing. Um, you know, it, nothing, I'm not uh, trying to have a party line here saying everything has to be made with in house by local crews. But I think that's what happened that instead of a mixing, you know, melding of the strengths of all, you know, private versus public together, they the pendulum has swung totally to the, you know, sort of a, cash and carry kind of role. And, and in fact, it's going to be tougher in the, in the future to see, even though they're easy to preserve, those kind of dramas, the rights are going to be terrible to figure out in the years to come. What was that uh, crack you made, the what office of BC? Sorry? You, what was the thing you said a minute ago? The something the post was office of broadcasting? The oh, what, say again? Say the post again. office of broadcasting. Oh, the post office of broadcasting. Uh, what was the reference there? Well, it's just that it just, I'm not saying that, that public broadcasting and the way CBC did it for decades is necessarily the ideal way. And I'm not for a moment saying we have to return, regress to, you know, an old way of doing things where in all the local production company is production team is hired there. That's never going to happen anymore. I'm, I can understand why it happened back in the day because you know, those big studios that you referred to at the beginning of the hour, Jeff? Uh, well, that, by the way, you know, you know that that building is designed upside down. So the heating and cooling, which is in everybody else's basement, is in the, is in the attic, quote unquote, to, to, to isolate the sound and vibration. And that's why all the studios are down on the lowest of the low floors. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. so, but those places were, you know, huge. And that's when you had Renee Simard and Wolfman Jack and all those dramas being done there because that's the way television was made in those days. You know, well, they, how, did, how did the Renee Simard show end up being taped in Vancouver as opposed to Quebec? Well, Renee was doing, Renee, well, that's a good question. Renee Simard was, you know, was really pushing into, again, you had those two solitudes. He was really pushing the English language. Uh, uh, you know, to appealing to the English language audience, CBUT was a brand new studio then. So at the time, it was state of the art. So it was probably the best you know, possible English language CBC studio for him to have produced then. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Things were so rocking in those days that it's before I arrived. But I've heard all these tales of cots being set up in the hallways down there. The, the, the hallways of the, of the building are 100 meters long, and they used to set up cots in there for people working you know, overtime and shifts. They would just crash there. There are dressing rooms and showers down in that level, which is great for bike commuters, but, you know, hasn't been used for production in that way for many, many years. But people would, you know, just literally live in the, in the building or on the clock because they were shooting so many things. That was the method of production in those days. Wow. When uh, we watch uh, Ian Hannah Mansing on the National out of the Vancouver studios, which part of the building is he in? He's in what well, I've always called it the Costco of broadcasting, that new extension that for, over the former plaza, that, uh, you know, that, that part that sticks out where you see the crawl overhead and the, uh, 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 the little white spot adjunct down below. Yeah, that's, it's up, upstairs and there's a small little uh, bit of stage uh, there and a you know a cameraman with a steady you know there's a there's a couple of robotic studio cameras and a cameraman with a steady cam. Yeah. Wow, what a what interesting uh, interesting uh, thing to learn. So you've still got your pulse on a little bit of what's going on with uh, film and so on, uh, or well the old film and so on. So fantastic to know that. And uh, have you been able to occupy your time quite well in retirement? Oh yeah, it, uh, I I don't feel it it it, it, it at a lot. I mean, I, I feel at times I'd like to be putting doing rejoining the battle. Uh, part of what I did there, uh, I was an accidental union activist, and I remember all those grievance meetings and the like. Uh, and and now still, I feel 
bad is, you know, many of the young, you know, the younger generation, they talk about the gig economy. I wish they were more full-time, uh, you know, careers, you know, uh, permanent careers at the CBC as, as in other broadcasting entities. But, uh, you know, there's too much of the gig economy going on there. I'd like to be rejoining those battles, but you, when you evolve to another state, uh, you know, what, as a superannuate, a pensioner now, you have to you know, engage yourself and get involved in other things. Well, fantastic. Uh, one last chance, anyone have a question for Colin? Just uh, got a quick question there for you. Lighten it up a little bit for the final one, I think. How many hours of footage have you actually estimate do you that you've watched while you've been doing all this archival work? <laughs> well, I could do maybe Matt, maybe I could do some uh, uh, <laughs> quick calculations. Let's just say thousands. You know, it, it, what part of what what was involved in that? Uh, we had a project from the late 90s for about a decade uh, where the CBC board of directors generously put out a lot of money to CBC and Radio Canada to archive their material. And so we literally, everything was sitting there, wasn't sitting there to preserve for, uh, for posterity, for his history's sake. It was there to re-air. It was, they were all there in metal cans on steel reels, just like you see the old images of the, of the movie house, you know, to put on a, on a telecine chain to, to, to re-air. And so what we did in all those cases was pull film off and take a reel it off to put it to, off the steel reel, put it on a plastic core, put it into a vented can so it would li live longer. And so in, in doing that, we ended up looking at a lot of stuff, maybe not frame by frame, you know, really paying attention, but at least getting, you know, in every case, whether it be myself or the staff that I was supervising we would look at the we would look at the credit roll to see who was engaged and involved and uh, so yeah I, that was a the great joy for me Matt I was moving beyond cataloging day-to-day -day news which is really glorified ambulance chasing and what was my original responsibility there to look at that other content the, the documentaries and the dramas that was a treat uh, besides, besides the Vanalog, is there anywhere else on YouTube where someone should look for old Vancouver stuff? Yeah. Well, as I, you know, you can bang in whatever kind of terms you want. Uh, there's another ex CBC or who who has done. If you do, if you do CBC Vancouver, you'll see a lot of old Irish rovers and and the like. Uh, but uh, I think what I was wanting to emphasize, and I, I know many of you have used. The, the city of Vancouver archives for, you know, to look at historical photos, but they have some moving image as well as this, this, I love that, uh, that BC electric line going down to Steveston. I just think it's fantastic. Uh, you know, you know, going, rolling along where, where you can now cycle down the Arbutus Greenway or, or parallel along Arbutus and West Boulevard, etc. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, folks haven't, uh, uh, had a chance to see the uh, f the one that's 53 minutes long, the City Reflections, 1907 to 2007. It's mostly looking along uh, Davy, Robson, and uh, Granville Streets from way back until up to uh, 2007. So a uh, real eye opener to see that one for sure. Uh, and then there's Vancouver Exposed in History and Photos. Of course, there are photo books. If you know, if you go into the Chapters Bookstore or the library and look up some of these uh, books, old Vancouver books, uh, showing old photos then and now type of things. Um, a lot of great stuff there. And of course, uh, we, uh, you know, at some point when we start to hold meetings again uh, for the Tour Guide Association, perhaps in the fall, we could do a, or we should do an extra meeting where um, we could have a bunch of footage ready to go and I could point out stuff and um, you know help people better understand uh, well wow this is what used to be here type of thing so all righty well Colin thank you very I, much can I interrupt the second Jeff yeah. Dave Lambert here how are you doing hello yeah, hello, hello Colin I'll introduce myself I'm Dave Lambert um, I just have a quick question for you who was your predecessor at the CBC was it uh, 
Was her name uh, Annette Kopeck by any chance? No, it was Jeanette Kopeck. Jeanette Kovac, that's right. Kovac, B A K. She is. She also has recently retired from the Center for Digital Media. So we're we're two superannuates now out here. In oh, isn't that funny? Okay, because I'll 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 tell you a little story. When I was a a, a, a library school student, a Slay student at UBC, I did a, I did a practicum at the CBC with her. Uh, and she was, uh, her official title at the time, I think, was a stock shot librarian. Is that, is that actually what? David, were you what there? You were? were you there on Hamilton or were you there back? Did you, was it when she was in Toronto? Uh, no, in Hamilton. Sorry. On Hamilton Street. That's right. Yeah, yeah well, stock shot librarian. The, the, the titles have changed. We were also called the you know, broadcast materials librarian, I believe. That's right, yeah. yeah. I think that was the title. It, it was. I uh, from her. It was but the you, funnest practicum I think I've ever done, and uh, and uh, it was just it was just a great time hanging out in the newsroom there. Boy, oh boy, that that was a high pressure job though, when you had to try and find some uh, some film five minutes before the newscast. You know, it was something else. Oh, I wanted yeah. that job so badly, by the way. Everybody's hair was on fire for that, and and uh, you know that's where I you know I coined the term you know the lack of preparation. Well, I, I stole it from somewhere else. You know, someone would come in there screaming at me, and I'd say, "Lack of preparation on your part doesn't con constitute an emergency on mine." And and you know, so yeah, in the early days, the first days of that, you, you get all wound up, and the, you know, your cortisol is going like crazy, and then you realize after a while that there's only about 12 basic stories in news that just repeat themselves, corruption, crime, you know, fatalities, tragedy. And so after a while, you, you begin to anticipate what's going on. And one thing I always, always enjoyed about you know, that job was you were an absolute peer with the reporters and, and the producers. And, and when they came in screaming at you, you didn't have to be a supplicant. You just, you know, said, no, 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 you, you blew this, buddy, not me. And if I'll do the best I can. And the editors were, were people I would bend over backwards to help. Uh, you know, they're the ones left with the, the deadline and uh, all those sort of scenes you've seen from broadcast news with the, the guy carrying the videotape and sliding under the, the file cabinet drawer that's ready to decapitate him. That's all true. I mean, all that stuff happens. Maybe not so much now because it's digital, but it's still, you know, lack of stuff. You need to get things lawyered. You know, there's all kinds of crises. You know, I would, you know, and I would hate to be an editor because your, your, your moment of, of highest engagement is the, the, you, know, the ulti, you know, the penultimate moment before you walk out the door to go home. Uh, how do you process that? But I'm glad you enjoyed that, David. Yes. Great, did, great. It, did, it, did it lead to another library? Did you stay in librarianship for a while? I did. Capilano University, yeah. Oh, okay. Fantastic. And I'm, I'm fairly recently retired from there. Wonderful. Well, what is, no, um, oh, go ahead, David. Go ahead, David. Ask another one. Oh no, 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 no. That's that's fine. I'm just. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask. Well, perhaps you'll know. My father, uh, uh, who passed away, uh, left a very large collection. He was uh, he was in the Kootenays in Nelson, um, as uh, at a, as uh, as an RCMP. He was part of the. Uh, famous uh, D squad that had to deal with the Sons of Freedom in the Kootenai. He left a very large collection of eight millimeter films that he surreptitiously took of all the bombings and everything at the time, right? So uh, I got this collection and I'm not quite too sure what to do with it. I'm aware that SFU has a, they, they have a pretty good archive um of the of the Dukabor activities at the time and i'll probably wind up taking it there but uh, i think it may be a pretty invaluable collection for them a filmmaker used used uh used a number of clips from his collection but the actual full-length uh, stock footage I'm, I'm i'm ready to give up right at the moment so i don't know whether you have someplace else to suggest other than the uh, sfu well, one of the things, David, that I, I think is, is, is important and you may want to think of, I don't know what kind of, con, you know, how it's logged and you know, stored. You may want to consider, you know, I can talk to you offline about this later, maybe getting a couple of them digitized so it becomes your calling card. Yeah. You know, so 
when you're talking to, to people, you know, and to, to get them engaged and involved, and particularly the fact that it was used in that previous documentary is a, is a wonderful thing. Is absolutely, you know, wonderful because then you can say, look, this is, you know, how it, how it rolls. Uh, what did your, was your dad go to university somewhere? As an, is he not, does he have an alma mater? Because that's often a place that is really happy to take on material. Oh, no, he passed away 20 years ago. On, on, no, but what, was he, did he, you know, he didn't go to university then? No, no. Yeah. No. I, I thought, I, yeah, that, that was pretty standard. I think, you know, a great history, you know, BC, you know, I think of, uh, you know, BC history is really strong at SFU. I agree with your, your, your initial appraisal, you know, sort of thought of looking around. Well, and there's, there's also some remarkable footage of the, of the Queen's visit to, uh, to uh, BC, you know, and uh, rides oh, on the Royal Hudson. And things like to that. open up the Massey Tunnel. You got some great stuff in there. You know, I should I should actually bring it down to you guys. I would uh, I would love to uh, if you ever you want somebody to to sit and talk about it. I'm, oh sure, yeah, no, thank you. I'm your guy. I'll, I'll get your contact information from Jeff. Okay. Please do be my Thanks. guest. Yeah. Yeah. How how drastically? I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, with the advent of uh, cell phones and most people have one and shooting stuff that ends up on the news uh that is that has changed things a lot right for the news people oh yeah of course uh uh and and, and it could potentially be for the good uh if we think in terms of long-term preservation I, one of the terminal i've given you a lot of terminology today and one is you know uh, they used to call film cameramen before regardless of gender shooters they shot things, whereas now we have pointers. And it was just kind of looking around, moving that camera quickly. It doesn't mean you can't do great stuff with, uh, uh, with, the, with, with smaller technology. But what it means is managers want you to multitask. They want you to tweet some, live tweet something while you're covering something, get the visuals with your phone, get the audio with your phone, write the script with your phone. And so it's too many things to do at once, whereas before, you know, maybe it was pretty hokey, but you had an audio person with the, with the microphone, you carrying that heavy gear around, you had the camera and thinking about doing camera shots, and then you had the, the reporter. So there you are. Wow. Different times. Yeah, yeah, sure is, yeah. Um, okay. There I just thought, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for spending time with us, Colin. Um, I really enjoyed that. It was eye-opening. And um, I'm also going to try to figure out how to find some footage that my uh, father was part of a newscast in 1964. So, um, it's kind of fun to do. Uh, where, where was he based? Uh, he was in Vancouver. He was um, on a program because a company called Sabatel and Sons um, created a harpsichord for the then Vice President Nixon. And uh, Sabadell and Sons was here in Vancouver. And my father was the French refinisher of the harpsichord. And uh, I, think, I think I remember that sequence. I think it aired on the seven o'clock show. Yeah, and it was um, him in the mask and the harpsichord in the background. It was a big deal at the time. I'll, so. I'll do some looking for you because I still have contacts who can search the catalog for me. Oh, I, that would be so that fun. That harpsichord re really it re is resonant to me. Oh my goodness, that'd be great. Thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, this has been fantastic, Colin. I was um, yeah. glad that I bumped into Bill. I meant to ask him the, the second or third last time I bumped into him in my building and say, hey, uh, what's this, uh, what's Colin up to? Do you think he wants to, uh, uh, originally my thought was to have you come to one of our meetings, our in-person live meeting, but the Zoom thing seems to be working out pretty good, actually. Um, so thank you for your time and we'll keep in touch and I will, um, uh, David Lambert and uh, uh, Marlene, if you want to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll send you the uh, email address for uh, Colin, no problemo. Uh, uh, so Colin, thanks very much. Uh, um, do keep in touch with us if you think there's something we should be aware of. You, you've got my information. So there we go. Well, as they say in lady, always a pleasure, never a chore, Jeff. Oh, it was oh, great. The, Oopsie, sorry. Sorry just to learn about Vanalog. I'd never heard of it before, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> well, I, I love the quote. I love uh, hearing old quotes, and I had not heard that one from, you said it was Winston Churchill, government, 
uh, trust them to do the right thing after they've tried everything. No, else. Americans. It's about See, America. It, it, well, well but, but who said that? Was it Churchill? Churchill said you can trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. I think it's actually, you can usually depend on the Americans to do the right thing. See, okay, because that, that actually, uh, that quote could be used for many different uh, venues like City Hall or, or the, you, know, you know, the White House. <laughs> Churchill said about USA. Okay, fantastic. fantastic. All right, everyone. Thanks for letting me share the time with you. So for, uh, thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye, bye, all. For everyone else now, we usually have a few minutes of uh, just general chit chat. Uh, anyone have any comments or anything they'd like to uh, say or do? I asked earlier about if we were to do these on Tuesdays in July, maybe move it up an hour or, or what do you think? I'm personally okay with moving up uh, to an earlier or a later time in the day, kind of right in the middle, kind of it does limit some things sometimes, but it doesn't matter to me which day. Yeah, well, I think I think later in the day is not good because uh, for some of us we're not out of the house first thing, but uh, by the time afternoon rolls around, one of my favorite times of the day is that period from about five or six p.m. It's still warm out, but not maybe really really hot like it was earlier, and it's a wonderful day to be out along the seawall. Sadly, the longest day of the year is coming up pretty quick, and we're we're still getting this cloudy darn weather. But uh, anyway. Um. Just my thought about that. Uh, I think it would be between um, you, Jeff, and Matt, because the two of you are the co-hosts. And so I think uh, uh, what you work out, then we'll figure it out from there. Because if we're not able to participate, of course, having it on YouTube is great. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I know from a number of people who've uh, talked with in the last couple of weeks there, they're just no matter what time during the day, they're still busy doing their stuff, but they're able to pick it up on their own leisure, which is perfectly fine for me. Yeah. Good. Well, again, thank you, uh, the two of you, and uh, um, Jeff, for all your work in getting these amazing speakers. Man, oh, man, it's been fantastic. No yeah, problem. indeed. <laughs> it's yeah. a very good job, indeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Matthew, thank you for the letter. What's nice that we didn't need to use it, but anyways. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm I'm sure it's it's part and parcel. I mean, I, I you know, the more voices get put out and the more it gets sent, the because this isn't going to end in two months. They've extended it yeah. for eight more weeks, but I'm not expecting yeah. anything different two months from now, especially with our closest border being in the state that it is. So, you know, they're. Like the, like, like the border sure, closure, yeah. they're doing 30 days at a time. They're, you know, they can't just say it's going to be in place for six months and then have to roll it back. It's a lot harder to do, whereas extending these programs piece by piece. And I think because what they're realizing now is that their wage subsidy program is, 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 is not being used because the companies just can't hire people back to sit and do nothing. So the, the money is, is, is being reallocated from what they had for the emergency wage subsidy into uh, the emergency response benefits or something like that. I believe it'll be retooled, but you know, they've got two weeks, uh, two months now to uh, take some of that pressure off. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, yeah. I, I, I would still suggest people uh, get that uh, letter. Um, I had a discussion yesterday. Yeah, I, I had a discussion with uh, Alistair Douglas yesterday of um, of uh, Rockwood, um, and he had just sent it off to 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 Mr. Wilkinson, his MP. Uh, he actually retooled it a little bit more um, as a as a re as a small business owner, and has sent it off as well to the new head of tourism vancouver now if anyone would like a copy of that particular one then then we can we can do he was in here earlier but uh not able to continue um he also mentioned uh, out of everyone that's here right now i mean there's only 10 of you that are left anybody here owning their own tour vehicle or not i mean is everyone here just directors and step on guides sort of thing right now yeah well, I've got my, my 15-seater and uh, 
transit actually, uh, Matthew. So. Oh, hey, Renzo. Yeah. Um, so one of the issues that is coming up now for owner operators uh, and drivers is um, ICBC. If you downgrade your insurance, your you know the fleet discount that you that you've gotten, they're removing your fleet discounts for companies that have multiple vehicles and such. So. Uh, most of the tour vehicles that I'm you know, just becoming aware of this and, and I'm <clears throat> reaching out to a few other people, we're, we're seeing that ICBC, A, not changing their policy right now, and their words were, it's, it's an administrative hassle on their end. So I'm assuming you're still paying the $500 plus a yeah, month for your I... insurance. I got only one, one vehicle, so basically I reduce it as using it as, as a cargo. So it saves you a few dollars, but... You know. But it's still licensed as a commercial vehicle? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, yes. to, I have to because I just have to go through my, my maintenance, my commercial uh, inspection just this month, so we'll see. So. Fair enough. One of the, the, the issues that seems to be coming up, though, is for other companies um, that are wanting to just you know, take off the insurance or put it on like a, a, a suspended mode yeah. right now they're not allowing that or if they do well once the plates are off um it's like winterizing sort of it, it is but they're not allowing them to do it and maintain their fleet discounts or anything like that yeah. so you know yeah. for the larger companies that are that are here the <clears throat> the you know and and smaller ones as well yourself alfred um you know michael <clears throat> lawrence bc grand tours jose at evergreen uh, a number of these <laughs> companies you know, larger ones lux bus and that they're you know that's that's a significant hurdle that we have to start taking a look at because for some companies i mean just just maintaining insurance in a vehicle that can't move is going to be ten or twenty thousand dollars a month and that's 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 just not tenable that that'll soon end the company i was able to defer my payments for my vehicle for three months so but i probably have to go to financing again can you defer another three months so we'll see just have to pay the ex extra extra interest, I guess. But it, so it's in your case, because it's still being used as a commercial vehicle, it's one yeah. aspect, right? So, so it's something we'll we'll have to take a look at. Um, if anybody knows of any other small owner operators uh, that uh, I should you know, reach out to uh, in regards to this, uh, I think we can you know try and get some we'll industry members uh, together with this. That would be great. Yeah, Matthew, did you hear any more about the extension of the CER? Because um, on the news, they were saying that uh, Trudeau was planning to extend it. Yeah, they announced this morning. There's eight more weeks. So right now, it's, it's, it's going into basically the 1st of September in the current, in the current status of the program. So yeah. It, now, I it, didn't get the copy of the letter because I wanted to send it to um, my, um, send it out. Did you send it to me? Uh, it was uh, in the link. It went, I'll make sure it gets into another. It went out. Here. It went. It went out. But there was. I had about twenty-five bounce back to me. Okay. About and, and that's unusual because it's like I usually have like one or two that we have issues with, but uh, that one had like twenty-five, and I don't, I don't know what was going on there. Okay, I'll chat with you, Gary, and we'll see if we can take a look at that. Yeah, yeah. The other, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, in regards, in regards to, the letter, to the letter, I don't know. I don't know. Most, most everybody here probably knows most, this. Most uh, everybody here probably age, knows this. Uh, snail mail. Uh, age, oh, Gary, we've got a really bad mail. double echo here from you. I think he's on a speakerphone. Gary, if you're on a speakerphone, take it off speakerphone. How's this? That's better. So far, that's better. Okay, so yeah, so what's happening? So what's happening is um, with the letter, uh, put it out to. What was I going to say? You interrupt my train of thought. Oh, uh, we're all, we're all of an age probably where we're used to snail mail. However, if you don't know, it's like if you're sending your thing to your sending a letter to your MP, there's no need for postage. If it, as long as it's going to Ottawa. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I would that's, suggest, that's absolutely true, yeah. And I would also suggest CCing the Prime Minister and the uh, leaders, all the official leaders as well. 
Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one part. Um, the Government of Canada, the Parliament of Canada website has the list of the individual uh, yeah. mailing addresses, but also the emails if, if you want to just, you can, you can email that one too. So either way. Oh God, um, no, it's like send them paper. It's like, let, let them do something. <laughs> <laughs> I think they've been busy enough in the last couple of months. <laughs> I was like, and it keeps kind of post occupied as well. Come on, fair enough. And get your ass, it gets, it gets your ass out of the house as well. It's like you actually got to walk down to the mailbox and put it in. The the only thing about having all the letters the same, they possibly gonna get bored about seeing every single letter the same thing, so they are not gonna pay attention. Maybe you need to change a little bit. It's one of those adapt. things. It, it's one of yes. those things, though. It's 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 when you get twenty thousand of something. Yeah. Then you know, once you've read one, but you see it's twenty thousand of them that have been sent to you, you start to okay. There's, it, it's the volume that is the key yeah. factor for that one. It's that volume that allows at least yeah. the numbers of voices to be heard in that way. I'm not expecting them at all to read all of them. And I fully expect most of their staff to just copy and paste a standard form reply for it. But if, mm -hmm. you know, you get 20,000 in this district and 500 in another district and, you know, 100,000 overall, that's a, that's a voice, you know, and it's, it's, yeah. it's one thing for us to be talking about it. It's another thing for that to show up in their offices that has to be discussed. I mean, the, the overall federal minister is Melanie Jolie, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, heritage tourism and all that sort of stuff as well. So CCing her, but you know, the whole idea of, you know, our parliament is, uh, is, is your MP is, is that voice as well too. So you want to have them be aware, especially here because my MP is Harjit Sajjan. He's a federal minister anyway. So he's got a, he's got a voice at different tables than the other ones do. And, uh, but you know, between Victoria and Vancouver, you know, this province and those particular areas account for, I think, one sixth of Canada's total tourism revenue. So the voices from here and the volume of emails from this area need to go out, you know, so, you know, it's important that they, that they're, that they're made aware and kept made aware as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've noticed downtown the last uh, several days uh, quite a few more American plates, and I've, I, I've been wanting to ask them, how did you get across the border, or have you been trapped here all along? I know we've all heard that story in the news about uh, Banff and the people that uh, said they were on their way to Alaska, and they're just holidaying, but uh, uh, I noticed uh, the La Hermitage Hotel was open, a few other hotels are open, so I'm thinking, why are these guys opening up? Where are they getting customers? Well, just I'm wondering one thing. about that. I've seen also Texas and Arizona plates. And I was wondering, are there maybe Canadians that were living down there and trying to escape into Canada? Because as a Canadian, you are allowed to come in, right? You, you are allowed to come in, but you got to remember too that they opened the border for family members to reunite. So if you have family if members Canadian on the other side of the border, I mean, they had to let you. They have let you in as a Canadian, to, even if you have a, you know, U.S. As long plate. as you've as long as you've quarantined for yeah. sure, yeah. 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 No, but the I'm other aspect of it is definitely. I'm also wondering. <laughs> yeah, family members that are reuniting, so you would see mm -hmm. more coming across from Washington State than that as they're driving up for sure. Well, I have to go too. Thanks, uh, Jeff and Matthew, uh, and also for the links, of course. Yeah. Until next week. So does the 11 o'clock again next Tuesday, I guess, right? Yeah. Thank okay. you, everyone. 10 o'clock. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks and a just lot. Just as a, a little update, just got a message from Tourism Vancouver regarding the letter. Um, this is from uh, Sabrina Tay uh, there. So I'll, uh, I'll peruse through it and uh, throw it in a summary for Gary to email out to everyone. So um, anyway, yeah. Well, thank you, Matthew bye -bye. and Jeff. Bye. Thank you, guys. Take care, All the her. best. Take care, bye -bye. everyone. Okay. See you, Matthew, I guess. Blah, blah, blah. Text me. <laughs> Text me, email, whatever. Oh, we're the only two left. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's easy enough there. I'll just stop the recording.